But it's good, it's, it's, it's awesome to, to um, do this particular talk on Father's Day because we're basically, we've been studying the minor prophets for uh, a few weeks in a row and uh, we, we landed on the very last book, which is today, which is Malachi. And Malachi is special and perfect for Father's Day because it's basically a dialogue between a God and calling himself father and his people and his children. And it goes, it's the a debate of back and forth and back and forth between, be, between God, the father and his people. And the title of this one is sort of reflects the sentiment of the conversation. And, and it's basically called, why is God not blessing me? Now, if you have ever felt that way or maybe feeling that way right now, can you raise your hands? Okay, so like this, you have this silent, and, and those of you who are, haven't raised your hands, you're not self-aware enough, so I just, it's, it's okay, it's okay. I, re, I respect that. Uh, but it's that feeling of, I think I'm connected to God, I think I believe, and yet somehow, I don't, I, don't, I feel like I'm not getting the full benefit of this, right? Why am I, why, you, you don't feel present in my life. And uh, so that's the sentiment that people had, Israel had, and God is responding to it, and there's this dialogue of back and forth, and it's really profound and wonderful because it reflects and echoes the dialogues we have with ourselves, right? And uh, between us and God, and even sometimes between all the significant relationships, between us and our spouses, right? Between fathers and kids and kids and fathers and mothers. So the, the, the historical context of this book is, is this continuum that, that, that basically is, um, it's the period where Israel came back from Babylon. Before that, Israel was a, their state for a long time. And then they were, in, they were all taken to Babylon for 70 years. After coming from Babylon, from, uh, from Babylon, from exile, only 10,000 people of hundreds of thousands of Israelis that left the, that land, only 10,000 come back. And they come back to this destroyed city of Jerusalem and they are sort of wrestling with their identity, right? Who are we? What should we do? Should we just take care of ourselves or should we rebuild Jerusalem and the temple in its former glory? Should we put God at the center again? Should we repent? Should we not continue the mistakes that led to the destruction in the first place? All of those questions are up in the air and there's, 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 there's this wrestling that goes on. So. So, so we discussed this in, in, in detail, and the, these people like Haggai and Zechariah and the governor of Jerusalem, his name was Zerubbabel, they, they were overseeing the restoration of the temple, and that got done. Then 40 years later, a new wave of Jews came back from, from, uh, from Babylon, and they were led by Ezra. Uh, and there was a book about it, right? Um, and they, they were also attempting, to, so there's another wave of getting back to the, a, 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 a collectively a we relationship with God. And they were restoring some, some things about a life uh, under God and obeying the, 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 laws, the laws of Moses. Then 14 years later after that, Nehemiah comes, and Nehemiah was a cupbearer to the king of Persia and a very close confidant who, got, who, who had a lot of, uh, gained a, through his life of godliness, gained a lot of authority and respect from the king of the biggest empire of the time. And, the, and so the king of Persia literally sends Nehemiah to Jerusalem and basically tells him, go, go to your homeland. He had so much respect from the king of Persia that he is sent and, 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 he, and he says, go and rebuild the walls around Jerusalem. So there's this other wave of effort, right? Um, so after that, Nehemiah essentially does his job. There's this wave, this upheaval of connection, and then eventually sort of dies down. And isn't that sort of the name of the game? of any relationship whatsoever, including a relationship with God, is that there's ups and downs and there's these waves. So that's what happened. So Malachi comes back, and this is the last prophet of the Old Testament. The very last uh, moment where God speaks through a prophet all the way to the New Testament. And he comes back at this downturn of the relationship between God and Israel, and he starts addressing some of these things that are happening in, in the nation. Uh, so there's this, there's this sense of loss of enthusiasm. There's this, Israel feels underwhelmed, right? They feel like they're not connected, that God is not blessing them. And at the same time, they don't realize, they're sort of blind to their part in this, 
right? And isn't that what happens in life in general? There's, there's a sense where you have perhaps arrived somewhere, but there's, a, there's an emptiness inside, and maybe you feel that way today. And you don't know where it comes from, and you start wrecking your mind about what, what is missing? What is it that I'm not doing well? Is God not there? Is he not paying attention to me? You know, uh, about a decade ago, uh, Deb and I, were in a place like that. I was in a place like that when we were in Los Angeles. And outwardly, there was just so much stuff that was going right. We had a business, we were serving in ministry, we bought a beautiful home in Los Angeles with a beautiful pool, and you know, we were fine, quote unquote. And yet I, ha- I had this deep sense of dissatisfaction. And sort of separation, right, from purpose, from understanding what, what is in store for me in the future, um, there was this deep, deep sense of not being present with my family as a husband and, and as a parent, um, not being really connected in the church community with relationships in a way that affects me in a positive way, in a, in a way that I could be vulnerable with someone. I could, I could listen to some strong, faithful man speaking truth into my life. And, um, and I remember having this itch to run. This itch to, you know, change, change scenery, somehow tricking my mind to thinking this might solve my problems of emptiness. Right? And, uh, and I, I, I remember had the, we had this very powerful conversation. I quote this conversation a lot. And uh, that's why you get married to somebody who's smarter than you or more spiritual than you sometimes, right? And uh, so we have this conversation, and I was talking to Deb. And I, and I tell her, why don't we just go somewhere? You know, just leave town and do something new and, you know, and um, have an adventure. And I remember she, she, you know how sometimes your wife is magically transformed into like a Yoda or like a, like a master, like a spiritual master, a guru. Uh, and, uh, and, and, and she looks at me and she had this look, you know how sometimes you, you, your spouse looks into the, your soul and you feel completely naked and ashamed? <laughs> so I'm like thinking, she looks into my soul and she goes, you know what, honey, in the sweetest voice possible. I think your next adventure should be an adventure within. Now that's, now that's, right? And, and that's what it was, right? So, so that, <laughs> that's profound, right? And what do you say to that? Like, you can't really come back from that. All you can say is, okay, I'm sorry, master. I, I shall go and repent, you know? Um, but but that, that is, that's what happens to us all the time. It, it happens in cycles. It will happen to me again, I'm sure. And I think that's where the place, that's where Israel was, complaining to God, why is God not blessing me? And you might be, and I was, I've, I was a, a Christian for over a decade by then. Um, my marriage was good. My kids, I was, I was in love with my wife. I loved my kids. We had this good life. But it was not great. You know, it, was, it lacked so much. So there was this inward adventure that needed to happen. And this is an inward adventure, perhaps, that you need to go through today. And the answer, I love the answer to this question in the book of Malachi, because the answer is basically very interesting. And I want you to remember one thing. If you don't remember anything else that I said today, is that all in relationships are blessed relationships. Now, I'm going to decipher this because the, book, the, the whole book is about that. And the, the, I love this answer because it removes sort of the mysticism of this, of this question, why is God not blessing me? Because if you, if you mystify the answer and you say, why is God not blessing me, must be something wrong with God, must be something wrong with me. He might not be listening, not paying attention. I'm trying so hard and I, and I am a good person and why is A, B, and C not happening? And what you're doing is you're shifting the blame to something that is completely outside of your control. And, and what we're missing is that the, the blessing of a relationship is inherent in a posture of heart, 
not in a decision of a person outside of yourself. Right? If you're all in in a relationship, the blessings come automatically. Just like in a marriage. If you're not all in in a marriage, you will find a stale marriage. That's guaranteed. And the minute you discover another way to be all in with your spouse, you start enjoying, just like that, this blossoming that happens within a marriage. Right? So that's what, that's what the dialogue is. And this is the back and forth of Malachi. In chapter 1, verses 2 and 3, he addresses his people and he says, I have loved you, says the Lord. But you ask, how have you loved us? Isn't that the question we all ask? Was not Esau Jacob's, Jacob's brother, declares the Lord? Yet I have loved Jacob, but Esau have hated and have turned his hill country into a wasteland and left his inheritance to the desert jackals. And what, he, God, what God is referring to is that Israel was picked as a family, as a clan. And between two brothers who were sort of the forefathers of these nations, he picked this one person way, way a long time ago. And he says, look, what he's trying to fig- give Israel is perspective. Because when we worry about not being blessed, we're mostly focused on the now. Like right now, why am I not blessed right now? Right? Why am I not getting my whatever, my raise, my clients, my next book? Right? Why am I not making A, B, or C or C progress in, in my business, for example, in my career, in my relationships? Why am I not losing those extra 10 pounds that I wanted to lose? I try so hard. Right? And these are small things, of course, right? And, and what God is trying to do to Israel is, 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 is give, him, give Israel perspective. And what he says is, did I not choose you hundreds of years ago? This is what brought you where you are right now. Right? Reverse engineer your blessings. That's what he's saying. And I think that's just, a, <laughs> that's an amazing thing, right? If we don't see the blessings now, try to just pause for a second and see if you can see the blessings up to now. What if you came to another church and not this church? What what would happen if you met met not your spouse but somebody else? What What kind of education you would have gotten if you were born into another family? What would happen to you if that influential person, teacher, spiritual teacher, teacher in middle school, music teacher, this inspiration that went, came into your life that we all have tons of, were not there. What if you were bo- not born in this country but another country? There's all these questions. What would have happened if that time that you almost lost your life, you actually lost your life? My mom tells me about this terrible moment where I was a hyperactive kid and I was she, she says there was this time, one time I literally ran into traffic. Like ran across the street. Probably five years old. And she says her heart stopped. Just stopped. She was collapsing in that second. Only to see me on the other side of the street just totally jumping up and down. And what if I was not spared? Was I not spared? By whom? Like all these things that we don't think of, we take for granted, that we don't think that we were blessed up to now in multitudes of ways. And that gives us perspective, right? See, as a father, on Father's Day, this is cool to, to consider, being all in with my parents, with my kids, is, is very interesting because it doesn't necessarily get, in, get, get interpreted with my, by my kids the same way as I interpret them. See, by my being all in with my kids as a, as a father, I can choose to bless or withhold blessing. And withholding blessing also means being all in. It's called parenting. Right? Now, on a kid's side, if I withhold blessings, they feel like I'm not, not all in. Emotionally, right? Doesn't, isn't, isn't that true? So when, the, when there's a withholding of blessings... Just in the same way, when we're on the receiving end of things, we get to throw tantrums, either outwardly or inwardly. Why is this not happening? 
right? Well, there's a withholding of blessings. It does not mean God is not all in with you, right? It actually does mean he is all in with you. And what he's trying to do is invite you to be all in. So when, when blessings are withheld, see that as an invitation. There's got to be a reason why you need this pause. You need this introspection. You need this adventure within. Because what God is doing is inviting you to fix something that is missing. Right? In, in, in verses 6 to 8, that's, those are the words and the sentiment. And God says, if I'm a father, where is the honor due to me? On Father's Day, it's a cool scripture to read, right? <laughs> if I'm a master, where is the respect due to me, says the Lord Almighty? It is your priests who show contempt for my name. But you ask, how have we show contempt for your name? You know how your kids, you go, you try to discipline your kids, and they're like, what? <laughs> what did I do wrong? And he says, by offering defiled food on my altar. But you ask, how have I defiled you? By saying that the Lord's table is contemptible when you offer blind animals for sacrifice. Is that not wrong? When you sacrifice lame or diseased, anim diseased animals, is that not wrong? And then, so let me explain this. This, is, this is, might be a little bit dated for us because we don't really sacrifice animals at an altar right now, right? But the idea was a relational idea. That's the construct. The construct of the temple and temple sacrifices was that you give something to God. You give it away, away from what you could have used for yourself. And you give to something to God that is the best you have. The best you have. And it's an agrarian society, so you would bring an animal, and the animal needs to be perfect. Your best animal, your first animal. And you have to give it away. That, that was a relational, that was basically a way to communicate all in. I'm all in. I could have used it for myself, but I'm going to give you my best. Isn't what that what every relationship wants? Right? And that's what God is communicating. He's saying, look, I'm a father. Where, where, where's the respect? And they go, what? And he explains. He says, you're giving me this, the, the worst. You're basically go, being religious on me. You're going through the motions of, this, of the animal sacrifice, but you're not understanding the heart of what I want. I just want all in, and you're not all in. And then he compares. He says, just like what I just said about all relationships are like that, right? He says, try offering them to your governor. He goes, see, you're... You're, you're abusing this because try offering this lame animal to your ruler, to someone who has power in your, in your, in your life. Let me translate it into modern language. Try going, like if you, if you have a job that you really, really value, try doing, consistently not doing your best for your boss. What will happen then? You're gonna be fired, okay? You're going to be fired very, very quickly. So you won't do that because you value that relationship. You're all into that relationship. And then God is saying, you treat your boss better than you treat me. That's what he's saying. Right? So then he continues. He says, do we not all have one father? Did not one God create us? Why do we profane the covenant of our ancestors by being unfaithful to one another? And he just, he just shifts. And he says, look, this is how you're doing it even among yourselves, right? He says, you're not faithful to your spouse. Your marriages are terrible, right? And then he says, you weep and, and, you, and you complain, but your relationship with people ref is, are a reflection of your relationship with me. You ask why, this is in, in, in Malachi 2.14, it is because the Lord is the witness between you and the wife of your youth. You have been unfaithful to her, though she is your partner, the wife of your marriage covenant. And then you skip a little bit down to verse 16, and, and, and I have the most powerful words about divorce. He says, for I hate divorce, says the Lord, the God of Israel. He's he basically saying, look at the marriages among you. They are a reflection of who you are with me. Right? I come from three generations of broken homes. And I hate divorce. I really do. I really, really do. I hate what is done to my grandfather, to my grandmother, to my father and my, and my mother. I hate it. 
the devastation is multi-generational. It really, really is. It took me years to go over it, as to, to come out of it and heal from it, as a, even as a kid. And I'm so grateful. The only reason I have a, 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 a healthy, thriving marriage is because of God, and because of the Bible, and because of discipleship. God hates divorce. And our, our marriage relationships reflect our relationship with God, and lack of. Right? See, because in marriage, just like in a relationship with God, the only marriage that thrives is the all-in marriage. It's true. If it's not, if you're not all in in your marriage, you're slowly going towards divorce. Either divorce, mediocrity, right? How many people do you know that are just in your marriage but only physically there, but not emotionally, not spiritually? Unhappy, unsatisfied, a, a ticking time bomb about to explode. How many, pe- how many people do we know that you look at, their, at the marriage and go, this is, this is just a matter of time. Something's going to blow up here. Have you, have you experienced that? Oh, yeah. Have you been in that? Right? So that's what God is communicating. And look, if you're married, especially today, here's what I want to tell you. Be all in. Don't we- be all in early. Don't wait to be all in. Recommit to be all in if you're not all in. If you've lost your first love. And don't allow things that separate you to stay. Right? Don't do it. Don't have emotional affairs. Don't think about emotional affairs. Don't go to porn. Because porn is adultery. You're cheating your spouse with somebody on a screen. That's what happens. And we can rationalize all we want, but that's what happens. And it's a slow death to a marriage. That is the definition of not all in. And what's going to happen, you're going to lose your marriage, or you're going to settle for a mediocre and unhappy marriage. Both are bad. And both fall short of the glory of God, of the glory of a, of a marriage that God has envisioned for you. Right? So then God explains sort of the missing, the missing link. You know, and in a marriage, there's usually fault. If there's, if, if, if our marriage is less than perfect, there's usually fault on both sides. Okay, I've been A and you've been C and you know, we need to fix this. And that's why we have discipleship. That's why we have the Bible as our standard. We can come back to the standard that is higher than our own. It's a beautiful thing. But with our relationship with God, God is already all in. And that's what he says in Malachi 3, verse 6. He says, I am the Lord, and I do not change. And what he's trying to explain to us is, look, I've been all in since the beginning. I've loved you since the beginning. I've protected you. I've blessed you since the beginning. That is why your descendants of Jacob are not already destroyed. Those are serious words, right? You know, it sort of resets the perspective. When he goes, are you destroyed? No, it means that I love you. <laughs> right? Ever since the days of your ancestors, you have scorned my degrees and failed to obey them. Ever since the very beginning, you have been all, not all in with me. And I've been always all in and I have not changed. Now return to me and I will return to you, says the Lord of the heaven's armies. But you ask, how can we return when we have never gone away. See, there's this, this, there's this lostness in the people of Israel. And it, everybody who's ever been a Christian, ever been a, a believer, been on a spiritual journey, knows this question. Because we're blindsided by, by a call to repentance. Because we don't know what we need to repent of. Right? Because we try, sincerely. And we go, I've never left. How come I need to return? That's the blindsided part, right? And he answers. He says this. And he, now he shifts and gives him another example that is an expression of not being all in. He says, you are under a curse, for your whole nation has been cheating me. Bring all the tithes into the storehouse, so there will be enough food in my temple 
if you do, says the Lord of heaven's armies. I will open, and tithes are, in the Old Testament, it was an agrarian society. Israel was supposed to bring every, one-tenth of everything they have to the temple. Ten percent. And they've stopped doing that. And once again, just like with the animals, it was not so that God needed an animal to eat. He is the creator of the universe. It was a mechanism to demonstrate and reinforce and nurture the all-in concept of being in a relationship, right? So not only were you, were you required to tithe just in general as a concept, no, you were, you were supposed to bring your first fruit, your best fruit. 10% goes to the temple, then the rest you live on. And they stopped doing that. And then he says, I will open the windows of heaven for you. I will pour out a blessing so great you won't have enough room to take it in. Try it. Put me to the test. So he's basically saying, you stop tithing. You're not all in. Try being all in. Tithe again. And this is a concept that is really hard for a consumer society like America, right? And, and I tithe. I give 10% of, of, of my money away to the church, to the poor, more than 10%. And it's interesting because there are different interpretations of what that means in modern times, in the New Testament times. Although there's, concept, it's all throughout the Old Testament. You go to any synagogue right now and ask them about tithing, they know exactly what you mean. And you can ask them why. And what they will tell you is that you give to receive. Not in a televangelist way, right? Give us a seed of $100 and You'll be wealthy in three weeks. That's a scam, obviously, right? That's not the gospel. The gospel is way deeper than that. It's a concept of being all in, of being devoted. And there's different interpretations of that, but what everybody in the Christian world, teachers, scholars agree on, is that 10% is a baseline for, for a Christian. It's not even a challenge. It's like entry level. Even in the Old Testament, if you start going through all the records, they actually gave closer to 20%. They called it tithe, but it was 20% plus of what they had, even in the agrarian sense of the, world, of the word. But as Christians, we're called for sacrificial giving. That's the call. And it's a deeply spiritual concept. Give away sacrificially. What is sacrificially? It means it hurts when you give it. So for some people, 10%, it hurts when you give in. And for others, when you give 10%, it doesn't even touch you. So then you're probably undercommitted. Does that make sense? Because yeah. so it's, it's not about the numbers at all. It's so funny, I had, a, I had a couple conversations the last year that had to do with financial giving. And one of them was a friend of mine from a long time ago, we were reconnected in a different city, and he was telling me that he's just not doing well, and he's just not happy with the church, and he was sort of complaining about the church he was in, and, uh, and he said, you know, I've, I've, you know, I don't trust them or I don't like them. And this is why he gave me a very good and convincing list. And he goes, and you know, I've been, I haven't been tithing because of that. And I asked him, I said, okay, so if you're in a church that you don't like, that you don't trust the people in it, okay, I can see that because humans are, you know, flawed and churches are flawed as well. But let me ask you this. Well, where do you actually give your tithe? And he couldn't answer me. And I said, well, so it's not about the church, is it? You just don't want to tithe. And he was just really convicted. He was like, yeah, I think you're right. I said, because, okay, if you don't trust these people or this church, where are you giving it? Is there no place on earth where you can give 10% of what you make or more? And he couldn't answer that question. And he, it really helped him at the time, and he's, he's back on track now and thriving in his, in his church community. There was another guy, also an old friend. And it was so funny, because I was spending, I was also in, in a different place, he was not here, so don't start looking for people, you know. <laughs> you know, sometimes you go like, what did, you, did someone tell you about me? Why were you, why were you saying that to me? And it, I'm like, no, this is the Holy Spirit. You know, it happens all the time in this church. So I just want to make sure that I clarify that. There was another gentleman, an old friend of mine, and he was a very successful businessman, and, 
we were hanging out, and, and I had a hand in helping him come to, to, to God a long time ago. So he was talking to me how well he's doing, and he's doing this, and he's doing that. And I could tell from context, from knowing him a little bit, and that he was, you know, he was... Um, he was, not, he was not being generous, not being sacrificial. So he goes, so Christian, in your wisdom, and you know how sometimes people try to build you up? <laughs> in your wisdom, do you have any words for me? You know, we're sort of saying goodbye, like anything that I should be paying attention to. And I said, you know, I think you should pay, you know, you should, I think you should consider giving sacrificially. It, does, it looks from context, I don't know, but that you haven't. And he was just quiet because he, for some reason, didn't ha- see that coming. And he just didn't answer. Now, fast forward, I think it was three years later, a common friend of ours was telling me this story about this guy. And it was so funny and so awesome because it reflects his heart as well. Um, so this other friend of mine, who is also a friend, this is the first guy, he said, I had a dream. I had this very surreal dream about two or three people in my congregation, this was the leader of that church, who made a lot of money and, um, and didn't give. It was literally out of nowhere. And he said, I had three people, three names, and I had numbers associated with each one of them, of how much they made. So he says, I went and spoke to, spoke to them. This is the guy I challenged. This is three years later. And, he, and, and, I, and I talked to him, and I said, hey, I had a dream about you. He goes, what? Yeah, I had a dream about you that you, you know, made a good, some, some great deals and I'm really happy for you. But also in that dream, I saw that you didn't give. And he goes, what? You know, what? <laughs> <laughs> we, we, we didn't go anywhere. Why should we return? Right? And he goes, and I actually, in my dream, I, I saw that you, you made $3 million. And he had made exactly $3 million just recently. And this guy was floored, just lost his He was just so humbled and in tears, repented. It was like, I'm so sorry. God has obviously spoken to you because no one knows this. And, uh, you know, it's just stuff like that, right? But the reason I tell you these stories is because this is what happens in every heart, in my heart. If we're not all in, we, we hold back. So, and, and the reason why God addressed marriage and animal sacrifice, and money. It's because these are the dimensions of our greed. These are the dimensions of our selfishness. These are the things that are, were current then and they're current now. We don't give our first, we don't give our best. We don't give enough of ourselves to God. We're not all in. And all in relationships are blessed relationships, which means the blessing, when you say, why is God not blessing me? The answer is, the blessing is inherent in the relationship. Right? So don't ask your, your spouse, why are you not blessing me? Don't ask that. Why are you doing X, Y, and Z better? What you need to ask is, why am I not all in? And the minute, I promise you, the minute you're all in, the blessing is inherent. It just comes out. It flourishes. You have a great marriage. Right? So, you know, as I said, about a decade ago, at the, at the season of, you know, like clockwork, midlife crisis. I was about 41, I think. And um, uh, I, I've been a fan of midlife crises ever since. Like, everyone I talk to who is in that season, I say... Have you had a midlife crisis, you know? And uh, you know, th- those are sort of, the self-reliant ones, they go, no, no, this is not for me, this is like, you know. I'm like, no, look, if you haven't had a, a midlife crisis, you haven't had a good life. You need a midlife crisis, because you need to recalibrate your life in the middle. That's how it works, right? And, uh, but I had to, you know, it was a hard time to reconsider if I'm all in or not. And to me, it was an exploration of prayer as a, as, a, as a bridge to reliance on God fully. And I came out of that painful experience with a, a, a renewed faith, really. And our motto, since that, since that time, the motto for our family has been, God is enough. God is enough. That's our, that's our slogan. Nothing else. 
Nothing else matters. God is enough. Everything else is overflow. It's a bonus. It's a dessert. We have everything we need in God, in our relationship with God, in each other. Um, I went through that. I went through this painful period of not trusting people, not letting them in, not being vulnerable, not being, because it's, pain, it's, it's, it's scary to let somebody speak into your life. We had this, this heated um, fight with Deb in, the, in those days, in one of those guru moments, right? You know, and, and she was basically trying to speak that, look, you, you need to let people in. You need to let people guide you. You need discipleship. And I would say, in the heat of the moment, she, she asked me, so who can you submit? Who? Give me a name of somebody you will submit to. And I turned around and I said, Jesus. <laughs> and you know how words leave your mouth? <laughs> and after leaving your mouth, you go, oh, no. <laughs> That was, that was one of those moments, you know, like, I just can't take it back, man. The overflow of the mouth, the heart speaks, that's what the Bible says. So I had to go through this painful exercise of submitting my life to men that I trust, that know me, that are godly, that have wisdom, and I stuck with it. I didn't run. We didn't go on an adventure. We, got, we went into, in, into an internal adventure. And where God was asking me, return to me, I, even though I never thought I left, that was, that was the call. Be all in, rediscover that, right? And uh, the reason why tribe is in existence is because of that, of that journey. I came out of it, we came out of it as a family, with vision, with clarity, with joy, with peace, with a solid faith, you know, with an all-in heart. And uh, we came here because of that, because of, of a new vision that we had. And this is the fruit, right? Um, there was a, there's actually a book called All In that I get, just gave John. Are you reading the book, John? Yeah. So in the, in the, in the introduction to that book, um, there's a really cool um, story of this missionary uh, called A.W. Milner. He's in the early 20th, 20th century. And he's part of a group that uh, basically decided to, to go into the most extreme missionary field. And he went to the South Pacific, these group of islands where the local tribes were very violent and they had killed everybody before. So there were no missionaries left because everybody was dead. So this group of people went... Um, and what they did is they, they did this something very radical. They basically, instead of taking suitcases and bags, they, they got coffins into the, onto, loaded onto the ship, and they put their belongings into the coffins. And what they're basically saying is one-way ticket. We're not coming back. Most likely we'll be dead within the next fir first year. That was sort of the... But we'll, we're doing it for Jesus, right? And um, <clears throat> so obviously that's an all-in situation right there, right? <laughs> <laughs> and they all went, and he went to this, to this tribe, and, and through God's power and grace, he was not killed. And he lived there for 30 plus years, and loved those people, and loved that tribe. And um, when he died of natural causes, he, they had a, they, his tomb was in the middle of the village. Not on the outskirts, in the very middle. And they put an inscription there that said, when he came, there was no light. And when he left, there was no darkness. Now that's all in. That's, that's, that's the chemistry of all in. And I think that's what happens to us, right? If we're all in with God, darkness goes away. That, that sense of incompleteness, even though outwardly we can be okay, but we're just not. It goes away. Um, when we're not all in in our marriage, that's what happens. And when we come all in, the darkness goes away. When we are not all in in relationships, there's not community, but there's just a group of people doing stuff together. It could be a religious group, a church where people don't know each other's names, where people are not involved in each other's lives, where people don't sacrifice for each other emotionally. There's no emotional labor in 
you know, invested in each other. And this community here, we planted not as a community that would become a mega church. We planted this, started this as a community that would be an authentic community of faith, and it could be 10 people or 50 people. But we would be all in with each other. That was, that was the DNA. That's what we started, and that's what we want to keep it at. And I think you can say that about, there are people in this room who, if I ask them, can stand up and point to somebody and name a name and say, when he came, there was no light, and now there is no darkness. When she came, there's no light, and now there is no darkness, because she invested in me. I can say that about quite a few people in my life, both past and present. So Malachi ends with this, with this messianic promise. And it's a beautiful promise, and it's a great way to bookmark the Old Testament. This is the end of the, of the whole collection right, of Scripture. He talks about, he jumps through, sort of through, through the temporary all-inness and not all-inness, that struggle that we're all in, to the, to the arch of the universe, which is the coming of the Messiah. The moment where all things will be made right. Well, all the things that plague us, whether we're you know, successful or not successful in the eyes of the world, that they plague us because we live in this broken world, that will only be fixed when Jesus comes back. He says, look, I'm sending my messenger, and he will prepare the way before me. Then the Lord you are seeking will suddenly come to this temple, the messenger of the covenant, whom you look for so eagerly, is surely coming, says the Lord of heaven's armies. In verses 17 and 18, it says, I will spare them as a father spares an obedient child. Then you will again see the difference between the righteous and the wicked, between those who serve God and those who do not. Let's say a prayer together and take communion.